Thank you, Mr. Hinkey, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to everybody online as well. Hope everyone had an enjoyable Sabbath, enjoyable week. It was busy for me. I'm sure it was busy for you as well. You know, as we approach Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, I like to talk about something that we all have in common, and that's something we all have through that is something we have in common as well. And I'll make that clear as we go through this. You know, God has given us his Holy Spirit to those who have repented, accepted Christ as our Savior. It is given by the laying on of hands by the elders in the church. 1 Timothy 4.14 says, 1 Timothy 4.14, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. So we receive the Holy Spirit through God's elders, his people. This is how God operates today. Since the Holy Spirit was given on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, that's how he operates. It's through the elders that the Holy Spirit is given. There are a few exceptions to the rule. One was the day of Pentecost itself. I think we all remember that in Acts 1 and 2. On the, on, one was the day of Pentecost where the tongues of fire representing the Holy Spirit landed on those who were assembled. The other one was the house of Cornelius, picturing God calling the Gentiles into the church. So now these two actions here, receiving of the Holy Spirit, are different from what we have going on today. As, as I said, we receive the Holy Spirit through, el through the elders. Turn over Acts 10. We'll read a little bit here about Peter and Cornelius' household, the calling of the Gentiles. Acts 10 and verse 44 through 48, we'll read. <clears throat> it says, while Peter was still speaking, here he's at Cornelius' household. While he was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. So some of those who came with Peter were Jewish people, and they were astonished at what happened. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Verse 48, For they heard them speaking with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then he asked them to stay a few days. So Cornelius' household asked Peter and the rest to stay a few days. Dropping down to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 11. Here we're at Jerusalem now. Now the apostles and the brethren who were in Jerusalem and Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with them. So there was this contention. Why are you saying that God has given the Holy Spirit to Gentiles. Well, it was up, not the Peter. It wasn't up to Peter. It was up to God who gave the Spirit to the Gentiles. And then dropping down to verse 17 and 18 of Acts 11, it says, If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I would withstand God? So Peter's saying, I'm not going to stand against God against this. This is God's will. When they heard these things, they became silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then God has granted to the, to the Gentiles repentance to life. So the Holy Spirit is a gift from God. It is one of the greatest gifts that we have. The word here for gift is dorea in the Greek, D-O-R-E-A. And from Help Word Studies in the Bible Hub, it says, A gift that is freely given... Hence, not acquired by merit or entitlement. In other words, we don't deserve this gift. God gives it to us as a gift. It expresses a brand of giving that highlights and also produces the good for the, by the giver. So it produces something in us. And we're gonna, as we go through this, we're going to see what it produces. The Greek word dorea is used many times as the gift of the Holy Spirit that is freely given to us. We don't deserve it, but as, as I said, 
It is given to us we defy, decide to follow Christ. It is the only way to be resurrected at Christ's return. Nobody without Christ, without the Holy Spirit, will be resurrected. Think about that. You have to have the Holy Spirit to be resurrected. So it's something that is very important to us, isn't it? The word gift, as I, we read earlier in 1 Timothy 4.14, is not Doria, but it still has the same connotation. The word is what we will be con concentrating on more today. Uh, the word is charisma, where we get the word charis, which is grace. Charisma is C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A, and it's used 17 times, 15 as, as a gift and two times as a free gift. Charisma, the definition, a favor with which one receives without any merit of his own. So it's not something that we deserve. It's, it's not... It's, we don't deserve it. It's given to us as a gift. The gift of divine grace, the gift of faith, of knowledge, holiness, and virtue. Also, grace or gifts denoting extraordinary powers distinguishing certain Christians and enabling them to serve the church of Christ. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. You know, another one of God's greatest gifts besides the Holy Spirit is eternal life. That comes, as mentioned before, is through the Holy Spirit. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That word gift there in Romans 6.23 is charisma. You know, it's interesting, in Romans 6.23, it doesn't say can be eternal life, it says it is eternal life. It gives eternal life. It's up to you and me to stay on that path. If we do, eternal life is certain. God says so. It's up to us to stay on the path. And if we do that, we will gain eternal life. So God gives us something through that Holy Spirit. That Spirit is a gift, but it also impregnates us, with a lack of a better term for that, with spiritual gifts, which we all have. We all have spiritual gifts. You may not know it, but we all have gifts, and they are given to, to be used and not to be squelched, not to be sat on. They are to be used for others, not for ourselves, but for others. So with the remainder of time, let's take a look at the gifts of God and see how we can use them. Again, there are many aspects of the gift of God. One we just read is eternal life, and how do we receive eternal life? We must have the free gift, which is the Holy Spirit. Also, Jesus Christ is a gift given to us as well. Think about that. He is a gift given to us by God the Father. He sacrificed himself for all mankind. But right now, at this point in time, he's working with you and I. He's working with the church. So these gifts that we're talking about today are for people who have God's Holy Spirit or in the church. Acts 2.38 says, Acts 2.38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift, the Doria, of the Holy Spirit. It's a free gift. It's nothing, again, nothing that we deserve. Through that Holy Spirit, God gives us gifts, charisma, for tools in serving the church. They are tools for serving in the church. So let's look at Romans 12. This is the first section here that talks about spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. We'll start reading in verse 3 of Romans 12. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dwelt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. That's something we need to have make clear. Is there are many members, but we don't have the same function. We all have different areas that, we work, that God's working with us in. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So our gifts, we'll stop there, our gifts differ according to God's grace that he has given to us. 
And then he says, in the rest of verse 6, the first part of it, let us use them. Let us use these gifts. These gifts must be used, and they are, these are gifts that are given to, as God sees fit. He gives them to us as he sees fit. Again, in verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And here is the first gift that God gives us. If it's prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion of our faith. The word prophecy means to make clear, to assert as a priority. You know, what does God say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? It's a priority. Also, properly, what is clarified beforehand. Prophecy which involves divinely empowered foretelling, asserting the mind of God or foretelling or predicting the future. The word proportion here is an interesting word. It means, to be anal it means analogous reasoning, moving from one point of a comparison to the other, making sense of it, making sense of prophecy, showing how prophecy works, showing how the future looks. How is this done? Do we have anyone in here that has a spirit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy? I think all of us do. It is the gift of what is in the future and being able to explain it, right? We can explain what the future looks like to a certain extent, of course. We have an understanding to a certain point through God's holy days, which picture the future. It's prophecy. It all differs from one person to another with their ability to explain future events, though. Some ministers are stronger than others in explaining prophecy. They can come up here and, and speak on prophecy and just flow right through it. With others like me, I, I struggle through it. The second one here in verse 7 is, I'm not, I'm not going to read the scriptures here. I think there's a few that I might read, verse 7. But the second one is ministering. This is an interesting one, too. It means to serve or serving. So this is a, a fruit of the, or fruit, not a fruit of the Spirit, a gift of the Spirit, those who execute the commands of others, such as a deacon. So a deacon would, if is, is told to do something by an elder, you, the deacon would do it. But it's more than just that. It's serving. It's ministering to others. It also can, be, can mean to prepare and present food. Those who do coffee duties are ministering by preparing and presenting food, right? The third one is teaching. It means one who delivers and instructs. That's also in verse 7. So the third, third gift is teaching. This can be those who speak up here, like me, and others who speak up here, and also those who are able to explain clearly certain things of truth. All of you, I'm sure, can explain certain things of truth. What about those who teach our children in Sabbath school? They're teachers too. They're ministering as well, or teaching as well. Now, I believe there are many who have these last two gifts that we just talked about, ministering and teaching, that really haven't figured that out yet, or just haven't scratched the surface of how strong they are in these areas. And to find that out, what do we do? Well, we go to God and ask. Some of us have these gifts, but just don't know it. Think about that. Some of us have these gifts, just don't know it. We all have varying gifts. God says that. But there are some gifts that we all have, but they vary in, in how we use them and how they're used. The fourth one is exhortation, which is found in verse 8. It means encouragement, one who urges people with God's words of hope and faith. It can mean carrying God's message to someone else. So someone who, who needs to be encouraged, we give them God's message of comfort, of compassion, of love, of mercy. I'll give you an example. Turn over, keep your hand there, and we'll turn over to 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. And we'll read verses 3 through 4. 
It says, Blessed be the God and Father of all of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. So when we give comfort, that comfort comes from God, and we are to give it to others. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a circuit. We are comforted by God. We are to turn around and comfort others. It's a, it's a circuit, an unbroken circuit. That's what God wants us to use. This is what an exhortation means. There are some of you who have this gift of comforting others with God's word. I wish I could be better in this area. You know, it comes when we comfort others as if God sent you to them on his behalf. Think about that. If we're comforting others as God is sending you on his behalf. And again, I like to be stronger in this area and not be like Job's wife who said, curse God and die. No comfort there, was there? No. Job's wife was not a comforter at this point in time. So we must use God's Holy Spirit to be able to comfort others, to exhort one another. And the fifth one is to be givers. One who is gracious and gives with sincerity, not expecting anything in return. There are some of you who thrive in this area, who are givers, who thrive in this area. And the sixth one is one who leads. From Again, from the Bible Hub, Help Word Studies, it means it underlines the effectiveness of influence people by having a respected reputation, i.e., one built on a solid track record. This happens by setting the example of excellence by living in faith. And there are many here who live in faith. It is a gift. One who leads. I think we are all leaders as well. But God, again, God gives us certain gifts, and, and they vary in certain stages. Again, Sabbath teacher. Now, you're not going to want someone to teach your kid Sabbath school who just came into the church and doesn't know anything about the truth, right? Someone who's, who we can trust, who has a good reputation of the scriptures, it also literally means one who stands before and referring to a well-established character which provides a needed model to direct others. I'll read that again. One who stands before and referring to a well-established character which provides a needed model to direct others. Who does this describe? Certainly not me. It describes Jesus Christ, the perfect leader. He led his disciples to godliness. He led his disciples to eternal life, to repentance. He was the perfect teacher. He was the perfect minister. He was a perfect leader. I believe he, I'm sure he was a perfect encourager too as well. The, sev the seventh one is being able to show mercy. Acting on God's terms and showing his mercy to bring help to those in need. That's showing mercy. We do this with a cheerfulness, with cheerfulness, or ready to respond with a cheerful heart. Again, some of these, some of us have these gifts and use them very well. Some of them have them, have these gifts, and just don't know it yet. God has given you gifts, and you need to ask God to find out what these gifts are and how to use them. But also, as we're going to find out later here in just a little bit, also how to search them out. He's not going to give you wisdom as a, you know, unless you want to search it out. He's not going to give you a gift of wisdom or knowledge unless you search it out. He does, he, he gives the gifts as he sees fit. And if you're unsure, go to God and ask him and have him show you where your gifts are and ask him how to use them. 1 Corinthians, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 6 and 7. Even as the testimony of Jesus Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God has given us gifts according to his will. We are not to come short of those gifts, as it says. We're to use them and not sit on them and let them die out. 
The phrase come short means to don't leave behind or being or having or being a failure being or failing to reach the goal. Again from Bible Hub it says to come short of the goal. To come late such as the wedding feast. Interesting how that term is put there. I.e. the door is locked. You know God gives us these gifts we're supposed to use them. He doesn't want us not to use them. Remember the 10 virgins don't let your gifts be snuffed out. Build that Holy Spirit that God has given us and use those gifts that God has given us through that Holy Spirit. Don't sit on them. I'm going to read from Barclays, uh, page 15 in Barclays commentary on this. Read a paragraph here. It says, It gives to each of us the, the gifts of God, the Holy Spirit, whatever get, special gifts we may possess and whatever special equipment we may have for life. We have the gift of speech, the gift of healing. If we have the gift of music or of any art, if we have the gift to use our hands create creatively, all these gifts come from God. If we fully realize that, it would bring a new atmosphere and character into life. Such skills as we possess are not our own achievement. They are gifts from God and therefore they are held in trust. God trusts us to use them. They are to be used not as, to, as we want to use them, but as God wants us to use them. Not for our profit or prestige, but for the glory of God and for the good of all. So what did we get out of that? These gifts that we, we are given are for the profit of all, and they are to glorify God. And they are to help other people, not ourselves but to help other people. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. As we, There's nine gifts that are mentioned here. or I think it's only eight. I messed up when I was going through this. One of them is not a, a gift. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we, have, uh, we have the nine gifts that God doles out to his people who have God's spirit. So Paul just finishes in chapter 11, uh, speaking about the Passover and how to keep it, also examining how to examine ourselves. Now he goes into the gifts of the Spirit in verse 1 of chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts. Now that translation isn't all that great right there. Uh, the Greek here for spiritual is pneumatikos. I'll spell it for you. P-N-E-U-M-A-T-I-K-O-S. And it means, to be, it means belonging to a spirit or belonging to the Holy Spirit, or one who is filled with, a, filled with and governed by the Spirit of God. So you could read this scripture this way. Now, concerning the things of the Holy Spirit. You could read it that way. Or you could read it this way. Now, concerning the things of the Spirit. Or you can say, concerning spiritual things. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about gifts from the Holy Spirit. So now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do, want, I do not want you to be ignorant. God doesn't want us to be ignorant by the gifts that he gives us. He wants us to know that we have them. Verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So it is truly by the Holy Spirit that we are able to understand about who Christ and God the Father truly are. You know, we understand that they are not a trinity, and the Holy Spirit is part of that trinity. We understand that. The Spirit is the unifying factor that it makes us one body. It makes us the one church. It makes us the body of Christ. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. That word diversities can be translated distribution of gifts through the one Spirit, or it can mean a distinction of gifts. We all have gifts and they're, they're distinct from one another and to a certain extent. It means also a reaching across, such as God reaching across to us to give us these gifts through the Holy Spirit. Again, from the Bible Hub Help Word Studies, 
I use that because it explains what the Greek word really means. It, it, it just kind of clarifies things a little bit better. I've gone to other ones and finds it doesn't explain it as well as this does. It is God who is making a personal choice to give sovereign endowments of grace to his people so they too can reach across to others. You and I are to reach across to others and use these gifts. In other words, gifts are to be used to help others, not to be sat on, as I mentioned earlier. Verse 5 of chapter 12, there are different ministries, but the same Lord. So here we have the beginning of the list. Ministries, um, it's the same one we, word, we read back in Romans 12. Uh, this, these are ministries that are serving and done with a willing and voluntary attitude, as we read in, in Romans 12. The second one in verse, si in verse 6 here, it says, um, let's see, and there are diversities of activities. And that's an interesting word. I, I was kind of confused on that one I was, as I looked up the Greek word and what it really meant. It means focusing on the results of God's energy, his power, and people, and people living in his faith. The faithful living and using that energy that we receive from the Spirit of God. And I, I started meditating on this as I was trying to figure out what this is really talking about. And then it just hit me. God sometimes just kind of knocks you over the side of the head. Sometimes it's, duh. And so we come to church, right? Who opens the door? Who, who does the opening? Someone opens the door. Who does the, the, the coffee and the food? These are all, all energies. These are all activities that we're doing. Who does the sound system? Who does the camera? Who does everything back there? These are all the, this is all the spirit of God, the energy of God working in the, in the church together. As a, and it makes us a group, makes us one. That's what these activities are. I think we all have this activity or this, whatever you want to call it, this energy because it comes from the Holy Spirit. There's differing stages as well. So these first two are, in a sense, setting the things up to follow. It is with these first two that we are able to help in the church. All of us can help in the church in this. I believe we all, have, we all fall under this category. We can all use God's energy to reach across and serve others. Can we not? So now he gets into individualities. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. It's a coming to light. God brings, brings things to clarity. If we go to him and ask him, what gifts do I have? How can I help in these, with these gifts and help serving the church? It is a bringing to light, an understanding. It can also mean a, a, a bestowment. God wants us to know we have gifts, in other words. He wants us to know that you and I have gifts. Here's the key. If you have God's Holy Spirit, God has given you a gift or gifts. There is no question about it. I don't care what you say about it. There is no question about it. If you have God's Holy Spirit, he gives, he's given you a gift, whether you know it or not. These gifts are to be used, and it's for the profit of all. Let's read verse 7 again. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. The Greek word for prophet is sumphero, S-U-M-P-H-E-R-O. And we have talked about this before. It means a bringing together such as when a conductor brings together an orchestra to make one, music, one sound, one beautiful sound. Vine says that it means to be expedient. So we're this, he gives us the, these gifts to be expedient, to help others. In, these, in certain areas. From Expositor's Bible Commentary, it says, different gifts are given to different people. Not all have the same gifts. And I kind of disagree with that. I think so, some of us all have these same gifts, as I mentioned earlier. The energy, the ministry, to be able to teach others, prophecy. It just isn't that we're in certain stages as we go through our lives, being able to explain prophecy or being able to teach. The gift is given to each person are clearly intended to be used for the common good. Not for self, but for the common good. Verse 8 talks about wisdom and knowledge. Now, it's black and white right here, but I never really thought about wisdom and knowledge being a gift. But it is. It says it is. 
We all have these gifts, but they vary in degrees, as I said. Again, is how we use these gifts, in the case of wisdom and knowledge, is how you seek them out as well. You know, if we ask for wisdom, he's not just going to go, there you got wisdom. He says that. He says, if you ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you, but you have to do your part. You have to seek out wisdom. You have to seek out knowledge. It just doesn't happen. It's not a magic thing. God expects something from us. All these come with time. All these gifts come with time. That's what I might talk about when we're, we're in different stages in our lives. Verse 9 talks about faith and the gifts of healings. They're gifts as well. Having faith is a gift. We all, have di- we all vary in different areas of faith. There are some who are very good at, at healing people in the sense of having remedies. But also this... Re- this, this healing can be come from God as well. I'm not going to diminish that one, 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 one point of that. Healing comes from God. But there are certain things, like right now, I'm, my back's killing me, and we're waiting for some medicine to come in. That one, I took one pill, and the next day my back was fine. Of course, they ran out. It never, it never fails. You find something that works, and then you can't get it anymore. Luckily, hopefully tonight we get it. But I'm telling you one thing, it, it works. It's a remedy. But God's the healer. I'm not, I don't depend on the pills. I know God's allowing things to be healed. You have to do your part as well. Verse 10, talk, I'm going to skip over this miracles. Uh, I'm going to be covering this next month, a continuation of this message. We'll show how these, how, what miracles, what it really means in the Greek, and see how it ties in with Passover and Days on the Limb Bread. So we'll just kind of pass over that one. The other one is prophecy which we touched on earlier in Romans 12. I'm just going to see where I am time-wise. And the other one is discerning of spirits. From Bible Hub, help word studies again, it means a thorough judgment and coming to a conclusion, discerning of spirits, distinguishing things that seem to be the same, being able to see the difference between good and evil. That would be one, something that we'd be all, we would all need to understand, comprehend. 2 Corinthians 11, I'll just read that. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 12 through 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself himself, transforms himself into an angel of light. We need to be able to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is truth, what is a lie. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Hebrews 5.14, again, I'll just read that from the New Living Translation. Hebrews 5.14 says, Solid food is for those who are, um, who are mature, who's through, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong, or to decide, or to, I'm sorry, to de- Recognize the difference between good and evil. You could say that as well. All of us must exercise this gift so we can recognize or discern from what is good and what is evil. We have to use this gift that God has given us. Verse 10 follows up with tongues, being able to understand languages, being able to speak, being able to translate languages. That is a gift that some people have, and I just, I, I don't have that. I can understand a little Spanish. I can understand a little Greek because I go through it so much. I can't speak it. So verse 11, let's read that. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as who? As God wills. It's as God wills. These gifts are distributed by God. Some of these gifts, as I mentioned, are accessible to all. Wisdom and knowledge, discerning of the spirits, but is now is how we exercise these gifts so that we can grow in them. God wants us to grow in these gifts. That's why he gives them to us. In conclusion, we have seen that God has given us one of the greatest gifts of all. That's the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. The free gift, something we don't deserve. He has given it to us once we decide to follow Christ and the Father, to enter that narrow path. It is given to those who are baptized and have, have the laying on of hands by an elder of the church. No other way. 
We also are given through the Holy Spirit gifts from God. When I say no other way, maybe God down the road, when things start getting worse, something might change, like the household of Cornelius calling the Gentiles. I don't know. I'm not going to speak for God here, but I'm not going to say there's no other way because God may have another way. We just don't know it yet. So I'll just leave it at that. We're also given through the Holy Spirit gifts from God as he sees fit. They are given to be used and in helping to serve the church. God gives them as he wills, as he sees fit. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4 from the Common English Bible. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. This is why it is necessary for us to pay more attention to what we have heard, or else we may drift away from it. Verse 2, the message that was spoken by angels was reliable, and every offense and act of disobedience received an appropriate consequence. There are consequences to our actions. There are consequences if we neglect God's Holy Spirit and neglect the gifts of God. There will be consequences if we just turn our back on it. Verse 3, how, we, how will we escape if we ignore such great salvation? You know, part of salvation is to use what God gives us, is it not? Use the Holy Spirit, use those gifts he gives us. It was first, it was first announced to the Lord, and then it was confirmed by those who heard him. Well, who heard him? The disciples and the followers of Christ heard him, heard Jesus Christ speak the truth. Paul heard it as well. He was taught by Christ, literally taught by Christ. He heard them. Verse 4, God also vouched for their message with signs, amazing things, various miracles and gifts from the Holy Spirit, which were handed out the way he wanted. It's the way God wants how he hands these gifts out. It's according to God's will that he doles these gifts out. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. Last scripture here, 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable. Being hospitable is a gift. Some are very good at this. To one another without grumbling. Don't do it with grumbling. Oh, they're going to come over again. No, that's not what we do. We do it with love, with compassion. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. That's our job. Find out what your gift is. Go to God and ask him if there is a gift that you are not using for the benefit of the church or there's a gift that you don't know you have. Ask him to help you find it. Again, we all have gifts from God and they should be used for the growth or the profit that some Pharaoh are bringing together of all. So let us minister to one another. And this can be ex exercised as we approach Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. As we get closer to Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread, think about the gifts that you've been given and use them, especially as we you know, help in serving the church. This is what this is all about. Find a way that you can serve God's church. And maybe you do serve the church. There's some people out here that serve the church. We don't even know they're doing it. And that's fantastic. And, only, and God's the only one who knows, and that's the way it's supposed to be. There's some people who serve the church that will be seen because that's how things work. Serving in the, in the coffee, doing coffee, opening, closing, whatever it is. Doing the, God sees that. We see that. But God looks at the heart. You, you're not serving or using the gifts of God to be recognized. You're using it to serve God and serve others. That's what he's looking for, the right heart. So let us minister to one another. And this can be exercised as we approach the days of, of unleavened bread and Passover. It will bring us closer if we use these gifts that God has gifted us. Don't forget God's Holy Spirit and the gifts of God.